So good evening, everybody, um, and thank you very much for having me. Th thanks to the um, Kiroshi Sarat Society to, uh, for inviting me here tonight. Um, Paul O'Brien contacted me about eight months ago to say would I give a talk on this. Um, this came out of um, some uh, two years' work that I've done on this particular subject. Um, the, um, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm not a professional historian, and as you can see there in the, my notes, which I didn't really want you to see. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, look at it, and I want to thank uh, Donnick McGowan for the challenge that he presented about two years ago. It wasn't at his talk, um, but he kind of said, to get somebody local to do some research on it, and that's what I've done. Uh, I also want to thank David Caron, who's online, and um, he's joining us on Zoom. And I, um, he's a total expert um, uh, in the area of stained glass. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful uh, conversations we've had on email and on the phone. And also to Fiona Griffin, who's online as well. Uh, Fiona is, um, she, she gave us a talk in, in uh, Ennis uh, last March about stained glass windows, Harry Clark, and she mentioned about the one in, in uh, Killaloo. Um, but she has lectured on um, Harry Clark and she's a true expert on, on it. She also happens to be um, the partner of David Clark, who's the son of Harry Clark. So I'm delighted that Fiona is here with us tonight, uh, even though it's, she's here virtually. Um, a big thank you as well to um, Nicola Gordon Bow, who sadly passed away about um, five years ago, and she's a total expert. Um, and I've relied heavily on her work um, for this presentation. She did an awful lot of work on stained glass and um, she's written a wonderful book, which I have on the desk here, Harry Clark, The Life and Work. So um, without further ado, so um, Harry, so this is work in progress. If any of you out there has any information about Harry Clark, please pass it on to me, because it will build more evidence about the the wonderful genius of Harry Clark was, especially in Kilrush, please pass it on. Because Donica has done a talk on this in 2019, I'm presenting tonight. You'll be hearing more about Harry Clark. Somebody in the audience might actually be doing a presentation on Harry Clark. Um, so thank you, Donica, for your talk there in 2019. So, next slide. So this is the Church of St. Sinan in Torosi Kirosh. It's a very fine, large Catholic church. Um, the foundation was laid in 1839. Um, it was, I won't go into too much detail because this presentation has got two halves. I'm going to talk about Kirosh and I'm going to talk about Harry Clark. I just want to show you where, um, the, this, is the, this is the plan of the church. There are a number of Harry Clark figures here where, where the red marker is he, here, here, and here, and then St. Bridget is down here at number 10. Um, so it's a very fine church. And, uh, and Donica, when he gave his talk, he was in the middle of the summer. Uh, tonight, no, it's, it's a bit too dark, so it's, uh, but we can go and enjoy it tomorrow. On St. Bridget's Day, this is the key slide. Uh, you can all go to bed if you like that. Just, but this is the key slide. If you just want to have a stay awake for this bit, um, these are the key slides, the, the key um, uh, windows that we're talking about. And in order, we have St. John the Baptist down here. And this one, can you see that little barker? Yeah. Uh, St. John the Baptist is here, uh, along with St. Jane. And they were installed in the church in, in 1924. And at the same time, St. Bridget was installed in 1924. So those three windows were all installed in 1924 together. The next set of windows were the Clancy windows. 
which were St. Edmund and St. Stephen, and that was in 1926. And after Harry Clark died, and after Father McInerney passed away, the people of Kilrush went to the Harry Clark studios and ordered the crucifixion windows, which are in the centre, and they were installed in 1932. Now, um, so look at, this is uh, Harry Clark. You can go online and, and read books, but Harry Clark was an absolute genius. He had an incredible gift for illustration uh, in both stained glass and as a book illustrator. In fact, his first book was as a book illustrator. And I think Fiona has done a wonderful job explaining that really he's, you know, he, he fell into stained glass as an accident, really. But we have a, Harry Clark's left a huge legacy of 150 commissions of stained glass. Um, and we here in Kilrush are extremely fortunate to have eight Harry Clark windows. And I encourage those who haven't seen them to go down any time of the day and just enjoy them, like I did this afternoon. And um, they, we are, we are, we encourage people to come and visit and see them. We've got John the Baptist, St. Jane, Francis de Chantal, St. Bridget, St. Edmund, King and Martyr, St. Stephen, and then the three light crucifixion. So most of the images in this presentation are mine, but some of them, um, I couldn't travel over to Miami. Florida to see the Geneva window, um, but maybe next year I could go. But I, I'm going to show you what I can. Uh, and it's, I'm not, this is not an expert, really, just my own personal view. So let's start at the beginning. So I'll start with Joshua Clark. <clears throat> uh, I'm a proud Clare man, and I want to talk about Clare and Harry Clark. And in Killaloo, we have a a Joshua Clark window, and it's the Rhine window, and it was um, put in there around 1911. And if you go over to the library in Ennis, this is a little uh, an advertisement that was in the Irish Catholic Directory in 1890, and it talks about Joshua Clark, uh, church decoration business, and um, ecclesiastical decorators. Um, so Joshua moved from, he was he had a kind of a publishing background, didn't work out, he had his problems, but he came back to Ireland. And by 1886, he, he got a, a lease in the famous address, 33 North Frederick Street in Dublin, where he established his church decoration business. And they were manufacturers of objects of art and sanitary stuff. Um, he married a West of Ireland woman. Um, her name was Bridget McGonigal, and she was from County Sligo. They had two sons, Walter, uh, born in 1888, Henry Patrick, or Harry, who was born a year later on St. Patrick's Day, and then two daughters, Kathleen and Florence. Are we all doing okay so far? Yeah. Yep. So I've got about four slides here. I'm going to go, the first half of this presentation is going to be about Harry Clark and, and where he fits in. From my personal perspective and from my little tour of Ireland and of the UK, didn't get over to America. So just, the, so 1886, we had Joshua starting the business in Dublin. Harry was born in 1889 in St. Patrick's Day. And he grew up, went to school in Belvedere, everything was fine. And then unfortunately, his mother passed away when he was only 14. And his father decided to take Harry out of school. Meanwhile, nothing to do with Harry, that one been asked him, but um, Edward Martin, the playwright, and Sarah Purse, the portrait painter, set up and toured Lina. And I know Donica Broad mentioned this before, the Tower Glass, Stained Glass Workshop in 1903. And they appointed this wonderful man, Alfred's child, as manager. Um, so that was fine. 
Harry was busy working away a little bit with, uh, with his father's business, and he got an appointment that that's work with an architect's office in 1904. <coughs> Then between the ages of 16 and 21, he was an apprentice to his father's business. Um, and his father had actually started living with stained glass when, when, when Harry was four. So even though they were church decorated business, they had started. And that's where that window that we saw earlier on in Killaloo. Um, Harry started beginning, uh, attending night classes in stained glass in Dublin Metropolitan School of Bars. And he did very well there. He he met his he got a girlfriend there and did very well. But which was extraordinary when he was 22 in 1911 and 1913, he won the gold medal for stained glass in the Board of Education National Competition in South Kensington for three years in a row, which is extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. Um, and when Harry was in the, the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, his tutor was the same Arthur Child, so um, did very well. So I just want to show you some of the images from that. So these are the three um, panels that are on display in the Crawford's uh, Art College or Art Gallery. Um, and they are the Meeting of St. Brendan, the God had enthroned and the consecration of St. Mel. Um, so they're down there, and it's like it's three years now. I'm going to write through these. Second, um, when he was 25, he'd be, he had his first exhibit at the Royal Learning uh, Academy in Dublin. He married his beloved girlfriend, Margaret, Margaret Frilly, and unfortunately, First World War started. He got his first, based on all the success of today, he was really quite a successful stained glass artist. He got his first major commission for the Home Chapel in Cork. And that was a huge deal to get that because there's a lot of competition in Dublin at the time with stained glass. So that was a wonderful thing. Harry's brother, Walter, married Margaret's sister, Minnie. So the two sisters, two brothers married in 1915. 1916 came Easter Rising, and um, there wasn't much to say about that, except that there was some damage done to some printing presses that Harry was working on, so he lost in the fire uh, on the Easter uh, Rising. Um, he was, an, like I said earlier on, a book illustrator, and he got his fairy tales of uh, Hans Christian Andersen um, published. 1917 was a big year. He, the Holman Chapel was completed, and that got rave reviews. That was extraordinary. Um, probably his finest piece of work. Um, Bud can give a wonderful review of that in the studio, and I'll show you that later on. And then, his first stained glass work in the UK was commissioned, and that's in Antwich. So, Margaret was a wonderful artist, portrait painter, and this is a self portrait that she did of her, uh, her, and this is a painting of Harry. And they got married in, like I said earlier on, in 1914. Um, they had they had three kids, Mary, Michael, and David. And Fina is, is, is their biggest partner of David. Um, so I'll we'll just move on. So these are a few photographs I took in the home in Chapel. I know we've got a her photographer uh, online with this, it would be a patch on him. But uh, these are some shots I took um, earlier on in the year. Um, it's actually quite difficult to photograph stained glass, and it's even more difficult when churches have lights on the inside. So please, anyone who's listening, try and turn off the lights on the inside because it's about the light from the outside coming in rather than lighting the space. So if I can um, encourage people to turn off lights, but when I'm down to the home in chapel, they've done a super job, but there's too much orange light. So you can see the orange light on St. Government here, 
coming through. Um, but this was all done in 1915. It's a wonderful piece of, of, uh, of, of, of work. Um, this is the rape review that um, Thomas Bodkin uh, wrote in 1919 in the studio. He was introduced to uh, Harry in 1916 and they became friends and a great supporter. Um, and I just quote a little bit from this rape review. He says, nothing like Mr. Clark's and of the Honan had been made or seen before in Ireland. Their sustained magnificence of color their beautiful and intricate drawing, their lavish and mysterious symbolism combined to produce an effect of splendor, which is overpowering. I think I got that book. You know, anyone who's, uh, it's great praise and it's deserved. Um, and that was by Thomas Bodkin, who was the director of the National Gallery of Ireland from 1927 to 1935. I got to see my sister, Mary, who's online. Um, and on our way down to various events, we stopped in to Nantwich in Cheshire. And um, this is um, the first commission that Harry Clark had in the UK. And you can see his style here. Um, we've got the, the Virgin and Child, St. Cecilia, and Richard Kerr de Leon. And this was commissioned in 1920. And uh, this is a full window. Um, and it was quite difficult to take that because it was around the time of the Queen's funeral and there was lots of people in the church but I managed to capture it. Um, so so Doric has done a superb job as as of other people in explaining the art of Harry Clark with the elongated fingers, the enlarged eyes, the vibrant colours, you know, and the figures facing forwards and orange sphere profile. There's melancholy in there, you know, and there's an edge to Harry Clark's work. There's, there's a lot going on. So you can get an idea of the style of Harry Clark from this. So moving on to Harry Clark part three. So in, in 1921, the studios were made into an English company. Um, Harry was doing some freelance work, but he decided that he'd join forces with his father and the poor resources and Harry, they would really control the stained glass piece. Um, but things happened. And unfortunately, Joshua died and unexpectedly. So the two boys then had to take over running the business. And so Harry and Walter assumed management of the Joshua Clark and Sons and um, Harry managed to stay in last bit, and Walter was responsible for the church decoration business. Um, the following year, they were very successful. They had to, be, had to move across the street to 6 North Frederick Street and had a big exhibition in the studios. And they, um, yeah, they, they were a great success. And from a Kilosh perspective, I've highlighted in here all the important bits, because I just want to put in context when our windows were ordered in the, in the series of Harry Clark's life. So I've highlighted in yellow um, when it impacted on Kilosh. Harry, um, in 2023, he illustrated this, um, it's about nine volumes or eight or nine volumes of the illustrated Irish National War Memorial Committee of Books Dead, which was a wonderful book illustration um, and which remembered the, um, the Ireland's memorial record of all those who died in the First World War. And then in, we had our first order a hundred years ago, right, in May, a hundred years ago this year, St. John the Baptist and St. Francis for the Coonan family. And then shortly after that, then St. Bridget was a separate order in September. Wow, okay. Um, Harry was coming into, Harry Clark's students were coming into really their finest piece of work around this time. And one of their gems was the Eva St. Agnes Vito, which won the gold, not the God, the gold trophy at the end of Chatham and the RDS. 
Um, and at the same time, so, when well, some of the artists that are working on that, we have really worked on um, St. John the Baptist video. Um, so, and in 1924, at Carondelet, those three windows were all installed in Kilosh at the same day, on, on the 9th of December in 1924, the big day for Kilosh. Okay. So, again, I said this is a personal journey, and so it, I'm going in the order of 1922, I'm going to bring it down to Gorey County, Wexford. Harry didn't sign all of his windows, but one of them that he did sign was this one in the, the uh, Leah Wilson Memorial window. You can see his signature there. Actually, you can zoom in a little bit now. You see that a little bit better? So, so he's got Harry Clark, Dublin 1922, um, but that's not, that doesn't always, he doesn't sign any of the windows. This is a, a gem. Uh, it's up in the, um, the Hugh Lane Gallery, Hugh Lane um, Gallery up in Dublin. It was St. Agnes's window. Um, it was 22 panels. Uh, it uh, illustrates the poem by John Keats. And um, many a book has been written about it. It's, it's, it's quite a small window, but it cost, remember this price now, please. 160 pounds, right, in 1924. Okay, take a note of that. Um, so look at, this was just a complete, um, there's great drama and magic in this, and I very difficult to photograph it when the lights were on. So I had to steal, this photograph is not mine, it's from the Hugh Lane Gallery itself. These are my own, which you can see some reflections, so it doesn't come out very well. So the final chronology of Harry Clark, he was elected to the RHA, his book illustration was published, and the second set of windows, the third set, St. Edmunds and St. Stephen were ordered by Dean McInerney in December of that year. 1926, he had a near fatal uh, bicycle accident. The Geneva window was commissioned, and from a Irish perspective, St. Edmund and St. Stephen were installed uh, on the 25th of September. I went to the um, National Gallery in Dublin to find his diary from 1926. More about that later. Excuse me. The first big commission for the States was came about 1929. Um, but unfortunately, things were, Harry was, his head was beginning to deteriorate and he diagnosed with TB at the age of 40 in 1929. Um, a year later, they formed the company Harry Clark Stained Glass in March, and that company continued until 1973. Unfortunately, Harry's brother Walter died in July 1930, and with that, the church decorating part of the business ceased. And Harry, his health was, was deteriorating, so he, he went to Switzerland uh, for the last, and he left Ireland for the last time in October of 1930. And he went over to Switzerland to recover, to, get, to try and get the fresh air, or to put uh, plenty of rest for his condition. Um, but unfortunately, he never came back. And in 1931, on the Feast of the Epiphany, he passed away uh, on his, on his, as he was returning back to Ireland. He, he got a good friend to ask him to bring him home, but he didn't make it back home. He got as far as Turin, Switzerland. And then, the Harry Clark Festival in 1931, the last windows for the crucifixion were ordered and installed in 1932 after Harry Clark had passed away. So obviously Harry Clark was not involved in the design of those, but he had a very good team around him. So 
my wife and I were up in Connemara and uh, I, I wanted to take the shortcut home, so we went to Ballon Road, which is the shortcut home. <laughs> Ballon Road has got a wonderful collection of um, Harry Clark stained glass windows, 16 of them. And um, the, we have, thanks to Trinity, for doing a wonderful job in digitizing the letters of the company. And we have a letter written down here on the side. Um, so on the 12th of September, 1926, um, Harry Clark wrote to Dean, Father Dean McInerney, many thanks to your letter at hand, also telegrams stating that the goods had arrived this is to do with the, the first set of windows. Many times, um, I'm instructing our man at once. When he finishes in Ballon Road to proceed to Kirosh, he should arrive there by Wednesday or Thursday at the latest. I trust this arrangement will be properly convenient to you and through the farm since Stephen and St. Edmund were installed in 1926. So he was talking about, so obviously, Ballon Road is on the radar in terms of being a certified Harry Clark window. Same time, same time frame, these windows are not. They should be. They should be on the uh, recognized as genuine Harry Clark windows. So um, this is an ex this is uh, an advertisement that the company bought out in 1925, uh, which was um, an article from the Irish Times, and uh, in it it says that the about how wonderful Harry Clark was. His drawings range from the swab. He did fancies to weird visions of horror. So you can see that there was all sorts of things going on. Um, the technique of all is equally impeccable. impeccable. And so there is something among them to suit every taste. So I went to the National Library in Dublin and I found the diary for Harry Turf for 1926. And some minuscule things about that size, tiny, absolutely tiny. And I thought I'd find the treasure, but nothing. You know, the all those little notes and um, lots of blank pages. And I went through each of the letters that we had to see. Is there any clue here at all that Harry was mentioned in Russia, but there's nothing in it at all, unfortunately. Um, so it's a minuscule pocket diary, and uh, it's about four inches by two inches in, in size. So this is a wonderful window in Killaloo from 1927, which is the presentation of our Lord with the Annunciation of Flight into Egypt. And um, Fina did a wonderful presentation in Ennis about this window. And um, it's, you can see the Christian teacher here in this section. And this window is mentioned in, in David Caron's book, uh, The Gazetteer of Stained Glass Windows, and um, as the only one in Clare at the moment, but I know David is probably working on that. And just to show that Harry Clark has never wrote in newspapers. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, we had the incident where the fuel is already entered cafe. It's not finished yet. So there are you know, four windows that are windows that belong to the building. And then there's two windows that are light boxes and they belong to the owners. So the judge, so it's an ongoing case. So watch this space. And um, so it comes to the court later on next month. So, like I said, I couldn't, the budget for the, my uh, trip didn't cover me going to Florida, so I had to get this photograph from the Irish Arts Review. Um, the Geneva window is a stunning piece of work, and a number of people have written books about it, and there will be many more. Um, it's a, it was a window that was commissioned by the Irish government in 1925 as a gift. To, for the International Labour Building in Geneva. Uh, unfortunately, it never got there. Um, Harry Clark designed this window and he went to a lot of trouble to um, depict scenes from 15 
um, of Irish writers, including Shaw, Yeats, Singh, and Emma Flaherty. Uh, it's a long story. Um, I won't go through all of it. But the only, the only piece of the Geneva window is this one here, which is from Mr. Bill Holy, and this is his mistress, and she's in a veil, and she's doing a dance for Mr. Mr. Bill Holy. The reason it's, it's in Hugh Lane is because it was a small crack in this piece of um, window, which was rejected. So they, they, they had to do it again and put it into the Geneva window. So the Geneva window um, was the Irish government rejected the window due to censorship. And um, I wonder why. Um, and then the window, the window was bought back by the family, by the, by the clerks, widow of Margaret in 1932. And the family finally sold in 1988. And it's now exhibited in, the, in, in, in Florida. So there you go. So so there you have it. Um, I just wanted to explain. So we're going to move into Kilosh now very quickly. Um, the technique of, of um, making stained glass, and um, this is a, an advertisement that was brought up by the company in 1926, and I just enlarged it here. There's 14 steps involved in making stained glass. You've got the working drawing, which will be a small drawing of what it's going to look like, just kind of a concept. And then there's the, the client will approve the sketch. And then you've got the cartooning. Now, if you've got a window this size in a room, it would be a full scale drawing. Very detailed. And this is where Harry Clark or the premier, the lead designers would, would do it. Um, and then from that, you get the cut lines, which are the the large shapes of the wind of the glass to get it fit into the window. And then you'd have a small image of the color scheme, the broad scheme of what kind of color you'd like to have in that particular image. And then you get the glass and you stick it in, uh, on an easel with beeswax. And then you paint that glass with whatever image you want to put on it. You finish it and then you fire that in the kiln, the first fire, the first kiln. Then you let it cool and you might paint it a second time and then you put it into the kiln for a second time. Then it's stuck up for inspection. So you see, is everything all right? And then you get the glazier, you let it up and then you cement it. Easy. <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of work. Um, so now Harry Clark is not Santa Claus. He is human. Right, so this is a little table that I've been running. You can't see it, and I don't expect you to see it. But in here, he had a team of, you know, maybe 15 or 20 people at a time. And I had this running table here of when people started. You know, he, he had a team of um, principal designers. So we had, like, starting with Joshua Clark, Hope, Arthur R. McBride. Walter started in 1904, William Nagel. Harry Clark started in 1905. Kathleen Quigley worked from 20, 1921 to 24, and so on. The ones in yellow are the ones that I think are associated with windows. Like William Dowling, he started in 1928, and he didn't finish until 1973. So Harry Clark was a principal designer, and um, but he had a wonderful team of people around him. And in this table, which I compiled from lots of research from Nicola Garden Bow uh, and others, um, there are 23 staff listed in the table, which includes the Clark family members, um, designers, artists, glaciers, and craftspeople, um, and even to an office of name from 1892 to 1973. So, um, so it's interesting. The, the, he, he, he is human. And unfortunately, like all of us, the time comes when he passed away, like I said earlier on. He was born on St. Patrick's Day in 1889 and passed away on Feast of Epiphany on the 6th of January, 1931. And his wife, Margaret, erected a beautiful headstone 
in memory of the beloved husband Terry Clark, RHA artist, born in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, on the 17th of March, and he died at Chur in Switzerland on the 6th of January 1931. It was a very small funeral, and but unfortunately, the um, unbeknownst to the family, the the grave wasn't for life. In Switzerland, you, you only have, it's like you have, you have to pay rent on the property. The work family didn't know this. So after 15 years, they took up the headstone, disinterred the body, and put it into an unmarked grave. So the sad thing is that there's no uh, place for the family to leave flowers. So it's a bit of a sad issue that Royal Harry Clark's memory can't be um, honoured in his grave. And hopefully some, something will come of that. But, but we are very fortunate in Kirosh that we have a wonderful collection of Harry Clark in us. So it's a bit of a sad story. So he's, if you go to Chur, you won't find his grave. So, um, but he's one, left a wonderful legacy in Kirosh. Now, this is the Kirosh section. So how are we doing time? Okay, I'm going to fly through this. Um, yeah, um, so this is Dean McInerney, who was the parish priest of Russia from 1906 to 1931. Um, this picture is taken from the Christian Brothers Souvenir Jubilee. Um, he did a wonderful job uh, in the interior and the exterior of the church. And um, I'd like to, I'd love I'd love to find out my um, <clears throat> my second great grandmother was Bridget McInerney, and she married Bartholomew Glynn, and Bartholomew is buried in the graveyard here. I'd love to know is Dean McInerney related to this to my second great grandmother, um, but I don't know. That's a personal thing. So th these are some images that you may or may not have seen before. But well, one is by Robert French. And this is the outside of the church. <coughs> but a couple of months ago, for about 20 euros, I bought this image, which is the one in the middle. And it's from the Valentine collection. And I've blown it up here to show you. This is some, some those three workmen working on the outside of the church. One on the ladder here. Can you see that? Yeah. And one here. And so one of it over here. So, so these are three guys working on the church. Don't know about the days, but it just kind of shows some of the early work that was done on the, on the church. Uh, can't be sure on the dates. And I've got some correspondence about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. So when Father McInerney came to get a rush, this is what he saw. The, the original three windows by Barth, and then these two paintings hanging on either side. This is a picture that's on, it's on actually on an information board in Tour Street. And this is from, from the from 1900. This image is comes from Paul Gleason, who's here tonight. Thank you very much, Paul, um, for a, a superb job. That Paul did as a student writing about St. Simmons Church um, and the, the work that he did uh, with Ken and Ryan. We are so fortunate to have that, and we're so fortunate as well to have uh, the original copy of that in the library in Ennis. So you could have, so those images are still there. So uh, that's in, in Paul, please. And so thank you for that, Paul. So, so there are the original three windows. So I'm going to. So I'm just going to fly to these now. This is the original uh, setup, the original three light windows in around 1900. And then Father McInerney engaged the Ashman, who was um, a pupil of Pugin. And Donica has, uh, he's my art teacher, Donica. Right? He has uh, introduced me to <laughs> To um, Pigeon. And so this is um, a, a Redos 
uh, ornamental um, stone screen behind the altar. And you can see in this image that there are three windows in the middle and then two other ones on the side. So I'm surmising, this is my imagination coming up, right? Of what did it look like? Because we don't have any photographs. This is what I think it looked like. Okay. So you've got the center in 1910, this would have been letting more light into the church. So Paul mentioned in his school project about Father Ryan saying that the twin lights in this side, twins in this side, and had more windows in the transepts. So you can imagine all the light coming into the church. A wonderful blank canvas for Harry Clark to work on. So Paul in his project talks about two paintings which had been hanging there on the side were removed and the two light windows were put in. I'm assuming they were clear, with no photographs. Um, and I'm just superimposed one of the other. So that's what it looked like in 1910. And then when the Kunan windows were installed, that's what it would have looked like. You've had the just the two here, and then the original windows, and then also you'd have St. Bridget would have been installed in 1924. And then moving along quickly. In 1926, when the Clancy windows were moved in, were in position, we still had the old bar windows in the middle. Um, and then in 1932, that was a final picture. You would have the food suite of all the Harry Clark windows. And we know from Baby Casey's diary, which is on the Climber uh, Historical Society website or uh, Facebook page, that the crucifixion windows were installed on the 14th of October 1932. So that's 1900s, what it looked like years ago, and then uh, this is what it looks like today. So uh, in Trinity, like I said, they've done a wonderful job in digitizing the documents, and that's where I found all these wonderful letters, but I wanted to go up and see them for myself. So I photographed them. Um, this is the letter book, and the letter book is a huge document. It's got about a thousand pages of a carbon copy of all the letters, all the correspondence. So I went through all of those digitally online, and then I went back and I photographed them. And this is the, the index page for the letter M, which is McInerney, Dean McInerney. And um, this is just highlighting the, what it says. So in number 66, there's a man coming to fix the windows. That's what that letter is about. And thanks for the McInerney for the check, right? <laughs> so that's the executive summary. And then in 24, 25, these are all in Trinity and they're digitized, you can go there tonight and have a look. Um, uh, and so you've got more letters here. And this is kind of an abbreviation of, of, of what's going on here. So he was corresponds about the size of the windows and the inscriptions. Um, he had to repeat, had to actually ask a few times for about the inscriptions. Please, would you put this in details? We're trying to draw them and get, get them right. Um, and then when they were confirmed, so lots of letters around the inscription. Um, he was apologizing for the delay in the windows because of a gas strike um, and also Teaches about the ventilators. There's a lot of detail in there. This is what the letters would look like. They were tied up. Um, the remarkable technology, can you see what it is? The very thin piece of paper, but the actual signatures do come through. And this is Harry Clark's signature. And that's just, that's genuinely Harry Clark's signature. And I wanted to go out there myself to see that it was. And this letter says, um, this, it was dated the 19th of June, 1954. I have pleasure in enclosing here with the inscription for the two light window for St. John and Jane, and would be glad if you'd be kind enough to return to with whatever corrections or remarks you have to make. These two windows are well advanced, and we're working on the window of St. Bridget. So that was you know, Harry Clark to Dean McInerney. I just quote some, some of the other letters. <clears throat> 
This is in the 25th of October. I've spared nothing either in materials or time to make your windows as fine as possible and trust that they will meet your approval and that of your parishioners. I take the opportunity of thanking you for your kindness and great patience. And then in, in later on that year, these are got to do with St. John the Baptist and St. Jane. We are greatly obliged for your kind letter of the 9th of December and a great pleasure in hearing that the winters have given you satisfaction and are liked by your people of Kilrush. We are also very grateful to you for the prompt settlement of your account and you have your receipt. And then in 1st September 1925, I've taken sufficient care in designing these windows and trusted they will receive your approval and those of the donor. Now, there are 23 letters on the record in the, from, the, from Harry Clark or Walter Clark from the company to Dean McInerney. And they're, they cover a lot of some details I've talked about. I won't go through them all, um, but they're a rich source of information. Actually, you know, as an aside, with this information, I went to see if there's any information in the, in the, um, in the Hill of the Archive and, you know, of, to, to, to reply to some of these letters, but I couldn't find any, any of those. So this is the order book uh, from, uh, which covers 1923. And uh, if I zoom in here, you can see here, so Reverend Dean McInerney, but I'll have another picture later on. So you can see this, this is where it actually came from. I'm oh, sorry. So it was the, this is how the order looks like. 25th of May, 1923 to uh, Reverend Dean McInerney to make and supply two stained glass windows in Jane and John, 77 euros, 77 pounds each, total 154. Now, est me fourth. Est, or it's a, to, je suis to a. Est means soonest. So this is your, not only, so the price, est means they'll be ready by the fourth of May, the following year. Right now, um, so that's what that means. That took me a while to work out. But what's this is the, um, so the Coonan family, the, the first two windows were uh, erected in, um, in memory of John Francis Coonan and his wife Jane. And they are buried in the ocean at Kyle Graveyard. And this is an image of the Coonan family or not, not the Coonan family, but the nine boys, because this, this image is taken from 1924, the Christian Brothers Jubilee 50th anniversary, and it obviously just covers the, um, the nine boys. And you've got, this is Uncle Dick, and this is Morris. They're residents in Frankfurt Street in Kirosh, and, um, Uncle Dick married my father's first cousin, um, Enid, and then later married his sister. Or sorry, his sister, Jeanette. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to, because the ladies are not mentioned, I want to make sure I mention Peg, Kitty, and Mary. They, because, and especially Mary, uh, or Mysie, um, because Mary uh, married Jack or John Silliz. And she was the donor of the window for the Coonan's window. And thanks to Robert for that very valuable bit of information. Uh, Robert is a, a, a direct descendant of the Coonan family. So, okay. so, so the windows are in favor, are in, uh, in, in love and memory of John Francis Coonan, who died on the 2nd of February, 1922. So, do you remember when I was telling you about the, uh, the 14 steps in making the windows? This is the color scheme, which is a small little, it's about an A4 size, no, no bigger than A4, you know, full cap size image. So these were, this is what's 
up and it's actually digitized as well, but I went up and I had a look at them and Trinity had them down as unidentified people. But I was able to identify who they are. So that record is now updated to reflect that it's St. John the Baptist and St. Jane. So the colour scheme for it's on the left and right something we are now and there and at the back of that image it's got the it's Harry Clark stained glass limited is on it. So now this is the first window of John the Baptist. So this is the full window on this side here. Um, you've got John the Baptist in a multicolored uh, robe, blue and purple and green. And it's got the scallop shell there, and it's a wonderful piece of, of, of art. Um, you can see down here the, um, the Lamb of God. Um, can you see that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's just a total work of art. Um, so, the Lamb of God is there, and so. Okay, I'm going to move on now. So it's wonderful with the when you photograph these things because you can actually see things a bit clearer. And um, uh, here on, we've got the baptism of Jordan. So one of the letters that um, that wrote, that the, uh, the clerics wrote to Father McInerney were saying that um, the, the commission was for St. John the Baptist, but they said, we are introducing two small subjects, top and bottom, into the window of St. John, as follows, baptism in the Jordan and Siloam will be for Herod. So we saw earlier on John the Baptist in purple and in green, and here's Jesus um, getting baptized. And we've got the dove here, um, and we've got some who've seen tonight aside, and this is the River Jordan uh, underneath. Now, if I just zoom in a bit more, let's see. And over here to Siloam in Herod. So, um, <coughs> so this is, so this is the second window, so I'm not going this more. No, it's not. So here you've got Herod and Herodias in, in green. So um, I was good. To, uh, yeah. uh, and this is Salome, uh, the, the, the head of John the Baptist on the platter. So Salome um, did this exotic dance for Herod, and he was so pleased. He said, "Whatever you wish." So Salome consulted. Herod had married Herodias, and it wasn't. Um, it didn't go down well. <laughs> and, um, the, um, so basically, when Salome was asked uh, whatever whatever wish you want, she consulted Herodias here, and she said, "We chop off John the Baptist's head." So when Salome came back to Herod, Herod said, look, you have to go ahead with this. So unfortunately for all men, John the Baptist lost his head and here, here he is. But this is um, the wonderful image. And I'll never forget the wonderful uh, description that David Kern, when, when David hadn't seen these images before. And thank you, David, for knowing you're online. Um, we had a wonderful time just doing what we're doing here, just going through the images and seeing things in these the detail in those, um, in each of these stained glass windows, you've got this macabre character here, kind of dodgy person over here. There's a lot going on in each of these windows. So this is a, a complete work of art. Um, so enough of John the Baptist. So this is Jane Francis de Chantal, 1924, um, and um, I want to zoom in here a little bit. So Jane Francis, she was um, 
born in Dijon in France in 1572. Not too many, many stained-glass windows of St. Jane, but because Jane was John's wife, that's why he had St. Jane. Um, so she was happily married, and the, if you zoom into this medallion here, you can see that this is her with her three or four children and her husband. But unfortunately, her husband died in a hunting accident. Um, and so she was left a widow. And as soon as her children were raised and looked after, she um, became friendly with St. Francis of Assisi. And she um, founded uh, a good number of um, monasteries for nuns. Um, and then, so that detail is in there, which you mightn't see when you go to church. And this is the, the like here, it's in the, um, God and all this, and this is the crucifixion here. So, um, so, so, so that, that's an interesting part, so that we're having married, and the Pope said to 12th of August, and she died at age 69. So um, this is the upper panel of the St. Jane window, but I wanted to show you the lower panel, which is interesting because there are seven nuns. And you can see one is partly hidden, and there's one here who's asleep. Or R and D prayer, one or the other, I'm not sure. But they so there, so she so, so probably six or seven, there's one in their part. <clears throat> um, she founded the new order of the visitation and she um, she set up 66 nunneries across the world in her junior lifetime. So um, she's a remarkable woman. Of course, it's even a more remarkable stained glass window. You can see the nuns looking up here at the crucifix and you've got the statue probably of um, St. Jane as well. So the St. Bridget Order was came through there on the 25th of September. And it was for 300, 300 pounds. And the, the soon state was the 29th of May, um, the following year. It says 2023, but I couldn't be right. That's a type by then. Um, so it cost 300 pounds. And from the records from James Gaughan's book and other records, we know that Eliza Brew donated £100 towards that. £100 in state's <coughs> money is €6,744. So it's not a small amount of money. Um, the people of Kirosh would have paid the other £200 for the window, I presume, uh, who don't have any other records. Maybe Mary McGowan's family. <laughs> No, but she, Eliza was a resident of Francis Street, shopkeeper, and the cousin of George Brew, and she was buried in the old Shanghai graveyard. There's no mention of the Brews on the window, it just says pray for the donors. So, um, so tomorrow is the first spring, St. Bridget's Day. So, uh, happy St. Bridget's Day tomorrow. Um, and we've got a wonderful St. Bridget window in Hirosh. Um, it's a massive window, and there was correspondence between uh, Walter and Harry Clark with Father McNerney about the window. But I, <clears throat> so her, her feast day is tomorrow, the 1st of February, and obviously now it's a bank holiday, and it'll be next Monday from now on. So if we zoom in and this completion of this window, you can see that in her in her left hand she's got a loaf of bread, and in her right hand she's got a container which contains healing oil. So she was looked after the poor and she healed the sick. And I want you to just take a note of this lady here. Um, when I spoke with David Karen on the phone, just like this. Um, he had the impression that that is not in the style of Harry Clark. It's more than likely in the style of Kathleen Quigley, who was also working on the books of St. Agnes at the same time. 
this style here is more like Harry Clark. So you can see that there's a bit of collaboration. It wasn't just Harry Clark doing everything, it was a bit of his teamwork. Um, so you can see that this lady's lame and this lady is poor or uh, hungry. And you've got some very interesting characters behind St. Bridget. She's spent by two nuns. You've got some very sick fella here and some very down and out and all sorts. But um, the, the, the window is heavily decorated by Celtic um, designs. There's no Celtic cross. Um, and the description says, St. Bridget healing the sick and feeding the poor. Now, I, I've, I've used my imagination again. Um, this here is my interpretation of the full scale drawing. The full scale drawing or the cartoon exists. It's in Trinity and it's, it's, it's actually logged on their things, but on their uh, register, but I couldn't see it. And unfortunately, it is, it is over 100 years old. It's very fragile. So they, they couldn't take it out for me to look at. Uh, I did ask, and I was went, went down and bent at me to please can I see it because I wanted it for some trace of Harry Clark or something. But unfortunately, Trinity are unable to release it and they're unable to actually photograph it themselves. Um, it's in two pieces. So the, um, the bottom half is St. Mel meeting. St. Bridget, and then the rest of St. Bridget as we see there above. So, unfortunately, I don't know when you see the light of day. It's pencil and charcoal. Uh, it's a shame, but that's life. So, this is a detail of the top of the window where you've got this lot of Celtic signs going on. Um, and this window, thanks to Paul Beeson and Father Sheedy, this, this window does feature in this book, which is Fair Beauty. Now, it, it's, it's the only listing in any book anywhere at the moment about the crush windows, uh, St. Bridget only. Now, there are eight. And I know that, please God, Phil, in the next versions, we'll get the due recognition. But you can see a lot of um, Celtic ornamentation in this window. You can see the she was St. Bridget of Kildare, and this is her uh, cathedral. And um, yeah, so we've seen this already. I think I, I don't find so, but this lady here we have a piece by Kathleen Quigley, um, and St. Bridget is obviously. I'm a dairy scientist, I'm not a, an artist or a historian, um, but she's a patron saint of dairy, of, of, of dairy, dairy maids and dairy men, dairy scientists, thanks very much. Um, but she's also the patron saint of um, poetry, learning, healing, protection, blacksmithing, livestock, and dairy production. Um, so, but, and I love the first of everything. It's a lovely time of year. It's first spring, so that's tomorrow. So there was a letter. This is a huge window, and so Harry Clark was wondering, you know, such a huge window, how are we going to build the, the gap? So Walter Clark wrote to Harry, to Bud uh, McNary, I've been thinking about the figure of St. Bridget in this very large window, and would not properly fill the space. I would suggest that you might have some outstanding incident in, the, in our life, illustrated by a group, perhaps, you will turn this over in your mind and just have your views. So he's looking for ideas for what you, would you suggest to put in this lower panel? Um, and a subject will make more benefits than it's in here. Apologizing for giving so much trouble. And we don't get to reply from Father McInerney back to Walter or Harry Clark, but obviously this is the result. Of it. Um, so I said, go on, put in St. Mel and St. Richard. And this is the point where St. Mel was a nephew of St. Patrick. And this is where 
simply just becomes an abbess or a bishop. But uh, <coughs> and you can see the pray for the donors here in St. Bridget and St. Mary and St. Patrick's Synod. And some of the characters in here may not be to the standard of Harry Clare. So this is maybe a bit of collaboration work going on. So this is the order. So we're moving on to the Clancy uh, windows. Um, so on the 12th of December, the order was for St. Stephen's and St. Edmund and the price is 154, same price um, as the previous ones. And the best word, the date was the 5th of December, the following year. Now the Clancy family were a very successful family. Um, Edmund came from, I'm thanking Paddy Waldron here because you've got a treasure trove of information about the Clancy family on his website. And thanks Paddy for information, but it's, it's quite complicated. It's Edmund and Stephen Clancy. Edmund came from Dunbeck um, and then he moved to Kilrushd. And he established a business around 1860, 1862, where he was a trader and his son, Stephen, he worked for a company called Endlin and Sons as a clerk, and he learned a lot there apparently. And he, um, that's what, this is, the, I'm not, this is, I got this from um, reliable sources. Uh, he learned the business essentials as a clerk in Endlin and Sons, and then he um, opened a business in the square in Kilosh, uh, top of John Street or in the square. It's a flour meal and grain store. And um, it was very successful when he lived in Burton Street. Um, and he died in 1923, which was the spur of his window, age 68, and he was single. And the donor was Mrs. Bridget Clancy, who was the wife of Michael Clancy. Um, and um, they were very, the Clancy's were very generous at the church. I'm just concentrating on the windows. I can see here the memory of Edmund and Stephen Clancy. And the Clancy's are buried in the graveyard here, just about in this far corner. And there's Edmund Clancy who died, the father in 1874, age 60 or 50, depending if you read his birth cert or the grave, thanks to Paddy Water. Um, so, so, so Clancy windows are, um, and then obviously, Charles Clancy went on to run a very successful uh, VG supermarket in the square, uh, but it could be cousins. So I, will, I won't go through all that detail, but there's a lot there. So thank you to the Clancy family. So this is the uh, window of St. Stephen and St. Edmund, uh, which is on the left hand side of the altar. So you've got St. Edmund and St. Stephen. And again, these color scheme, I was able to identify that for Trinity, so they have that updated on the record. Um, there's a correspondence about the, what inscription you want to have with letters on the, on the windows. And the cartoons, like I said, are the full scale. Uh, no, they're not cartoons, these are just uh, the color schemes. So moving on quickly. So, I'm conscious of time. Um, so this is uh, St. Edmund, and he was the um, Walter Clark wrote to Father McMahon to find out which St. Edmund do you want? Do you want the Archbishop or do you want the King and Mark? God sake, the Israel, would you know that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but basically, um, he was the King and Mark. So, the, the, actually, in the correspondence in the, um, in the, the, the diocese in Kilosh, or in Kilaloo, there's a letter from Abbey Stained Glass Windows, and they wrote to Father Canon Ryan, and they incorrectly um, identified um, one of the windows. So, so that record isn't right. This is from the orders. So this is St. Edmund, um, and the poor man, um, he's the king of. Uh, East Anglia, he was the former patron of St. of England. Um, there was a mighty battle with the Danes and they lost. And they, um, 
they want they, the, the Vikings were pagan and they wanted them to renounce his Christianity and he refused. So they they tied him to a tree and they threw all the spears and arrows at him and then chopped off his head. This is an image from Barry St. Edmunds where my uh, my big sister Mary lives. She's watching here tonight. Um, and this is the depiction of the same um, martyrdom of St. Edmund in Bray St. Edmunds. So St. Stephen, we all know St. Stephen, St. Stephen's Day on the 26th of December, and those in England, that's Boxing Day. Um, he was the first Christian martyr and um, he was stoned to death. And here we have a depiction of the stone of St. Stephen. And, um, right. So unfortunately, in 1931, Dean McInerney passed away on the 10th of March at the age of 85, and he's buried in the churchyard in Kilrush. Now, he, the, uh, all the letters stop we don't have any detail from now on. Um, so unfortunately, we're, we're now, um, when he passed away, um, Canon Hogan took over and the people of Kilosh decided to um, buy a commemoration window for Father McInerney. So Father Patrick Hogan says he is uh, Dean McInerney as parish priest from 1931 to 37. And he commissioned the three light um, sanctuary or crucifixion windows for the sanctuary from the Harry Clark Studios. And they cost 300 pounds, including wire regard. Um, so that's the order there in 1932. Um, and these are the, this is a mini job, the, the, um, the crucifixion windows. They may be by Richard, King uh, and uh, Ruth Chidi has um, written a wonderful book on, he, on Richard King and Rick, Ruth and David are invited to Kirosh to come down and have a look um, to we see if they are Richard King's or not. But Richard King took over as manager of the Harry Clark Studios after Harry Clark died. Now, what's interesting, and David Clark, I did a car and brought this to my attention, and I actually have written it out. This is from, these two images are from the Nicola Gordon Bowles uh, book. This is actually Harry Clark himself, and he posed in this style for this particular video, which is in Cherny And from David's point of view, and from my own point of view, there's a strong similarity between this in the Jesus and in Ternior and in Kilrush. So in a way, Kilrush has a very interesting connection backwards with Harry Clark. So unbeknownst to us, next time you're looking at the window, you could be looking at the likeness of Harry Clark. So it's a wonderful memorial to him in Kilrush. These are some images sent from the bottom or of the crucifixion. I'm coming very near the end now, in the piece now. Um, so this is the Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, underneath the um, crucifix. And then John the Evangelist on the right. And similar again, you've got presentation of Jesus in the medallion on, on the left hand side. And then on the right, you've got Sermon on the Mount. And this is the inscription from the people of Kirosh, which is erected by the people of Kirosh in memory of the very Reverend Dean McInerney in 1932. And there's Dean McInerney. Um, I'd like to thank um, Brendan Egan, the sacristan in Kirosh. He told me about this wonderful video uh, of the, um, the really early um, installation in the rose, the rose window. And thanks to him and thanks to um, Ken Ryan of the Abbey Stained Glass Windows, I was able to contact Michael Lurie, who's a nephew 
of Willie Early, this gentleman here. And uh, I have uh, copied the video, and these are some stills, and I have it on my stick, and I'm going to give it to the club tonight. But uh, I didn't want to put on the video because it's uh, half an hour long. But this is what Willie Early said himself in about 1996. I went into the church, and when I went into it, I saw the most magnificent Harry Clark stained glass windows that I saw in my life. They were a gem. And I figured, gosh, a bit of competition. So that's a compliment from a genuine artist. So this is the image I started off with. We've got John the Baptist, St. Jane, St. Bridget, St. Edmund, St. Stephen, and the crucifixion. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have a national and international treasure in Kilrush, and we have a very strong connection with Harry Clark. So, thank you very much. I have this, there's a list of references there. Um, Trinity, Digital Collections, Ignatius Murphy, three wonderful volumes of books in the library, um, Nicola Gordon Bow, thank you so much, the David Karen and the Blessed uh, Year, thank you David Karen for the emails, Strangest Genius um, by uh, Costigan and Colin, Dark Beauty by Costigan and Colin. Um, Ruchi, his wonderful book on the life of Richard King. Um, Fiona Griffin did a wonderful lecture in Ennis um, last year. The Geneva St. Patrick's Day event, which is the um, is online on YouTube on the 16th of March in 2021. And Fiona did a speech on that. Um, so does James McGowan, Paul Gleason, Brian Comfort, the Glean Archives, um, Paddy Waldron and his wonderful website, Brian Comerford for giving me the information to his daughter on the parish newsletter, um, Michael Early for sending on the video, um, and then the diary of Baby Casey. I want to thank Father Kurt Larkin. I've been pestering the poor man for the last two years um, to get into the church production gallery and get around the place. Darling and myself had a great time climbing up and down the gallery, going around the church, um, to Brendan Egan, the sacristan, um, for telling me about the video and for letting me climb up to the choir. Michaela Lou Dice is up as clear time, and Joe Somerville was the archivist for letting me in. It's been three Thursdays in there going through the archives. Uh, Bishop Binton, thank you. Um, Paul O'Brien, um, He's recently here tonight. Um, told me to ask him to do it. Um, Lisa O'Sullivan, Peter Byrne in Ennis, Donica. He's a gem, and like I said, he's my uh, teacher. Um, Fina Griffin, David Curran, Ken Anderson of Hollywood, he's the architects. Uh, Ken Ryan, Vicky, Abby State, Glass Windows, and Michael Early. Um, to me. Ashley Knockhart in Trinity, Seamus Malone in Emerald Stained Glass. Paul Gleason for the tremendous work you've done as a student school project, and then your walking tours, you know, you're a fantastic guy. Well done. Paddy Waldron, you know, for all the information. Brian Comfort, again, for the uh, mentioned the references. Francis Penter in the library. Randall Coonan, whose birthday is tomorrow, and my uh, godchild, Kriya's birthday is tomorrow as well, really, first of every. Um, Dan O'Gorman. Who, who did some construction work in the church, Gerald Williams, Robert Brown, Caroline Wilson for getting me contact with John Saunders. I met John today, he couldn't be here tonight. George Brew for information about Eliza. I met Mikey Carmody. Collecting my sister-in-law for her wonderful notes on Dunica's talk, because I wasn't at Dunica's talk, but only for Colette. This probably wouldn't have started because she did such wonderful notes. And Lastly, but most important, my darling wife, Bernadette, who's put up with all sorts of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, it's, thank you, Barb, and um, hopefully it's been worthwhile. So there you are.